Good morning, everyone. If you were expecting Russ Nelson this morning, I hate to disappoint you, but you got, you're stuck with me. So Russ has uh, got a hold of me this week, and uh, and, and I'm kind of glad to be back among you all. I mean, I enjoyed, uh, for the last four weeks, I've been preaching up at uh, the Macosta Village Church, or however we say that, uh, at Dar's Church. And uh, I just call it Dar's Church, although we all know it's God's Church, not Dar's. But uh, anyway, we want to welcome you all here this morning to Sylvester Community Church. And uh, we will start with a prayer. And then we're going to follow that up with a little, uh, just a quick little film about right to life. Then we'll then we'll move on uh, into our music. So let's welcome the Lord into our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us, for your love for us, and Lord, we thank you for this place to come and to give our worship back to you, which you so much deserve. Father, we ask that you would just invade us with your presence this morning, Lord, whether it be the music, the messages, the information that we get from a variety of sources. Lord, we just pray that all of those will come directly through the work of your Holy Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. This is the battleground culture issue yeah. in America today. How is it that we can trust an organization for whom abortion is such an important part of their business model to simultaneously effectively prevent pregnancy and prevent abortion? The problem in America today is that people simply change the topic. The key to successfully talking about abortion is to try to bring the conversation back to one key question. When you're an obstetrician gynecologist and you're pro-choice, you have to decide whether you're actually going to do those abortions. I believe that being pro-life is the most progressive value that we can have. The abortion industry is most threatened by Christians engaging in pro-life work. Finding that pregnancy center was the only person I had to support me at that time. We need to show the world that number one on our list is our interest in serving these moms. She's got to know when she takes that pregnancy test that her church is not going to try to treat her like the Pharisees tried to treat the woman caught in adultery. As a church, we can't just vote pro-life. We have to be pro-love. Well, next we have our opening hymn, and since how I'm not privy to what that is, I'm going to turn that over to this fine worship team here and let them lead us in that. Okay? We're going to be singing, Oh, How Good It Is. Let's stand.
let's turn to number 29. Glorify thy name. Thanks. it is to be able to come and to glorify the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Well, we have a little matter that we probably should tend to today before we uh, introduce uh, our first speaker. And as, there's a couple of people here this morning that have somehow achieved another milestone in their life. And if we put the two numbers together, I'm sure it would be you know, staggering, the, the size of it. But, uh, but, but one of them I got to go home with, so we won't mention about how big that one is. Yeah, but, but Jan and Cindy, if you're able, would you please stand up? <laughs> They still can do it. So let's let's sing happy birthday to them. Sorry. Only the best are born on Okay, only the best, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, we have matters of prayer and praise. Oh. I made eye contact this morning with pastor, so. Shall we pray? Father, this morning we are so grateful we can come before you with our prayers and petitions. And even though many were spoken, we know there's many unspoken ones and you know those needs and we just ask you to fill those Father, as you as, as you always do and as you will and in your time and we realize it's your time and not ours but help us to uh, to remember that but to continue to pray and just thank you for this church 
uh, the prayer warriors that are here and um, we, we know because of the amount of praises that we have. Um, some things we discussed this morning, we know there's gonna be a procedure tomorrow. We pray that that goes well and recovery is speedy. Um, we also pray for our VBS, Vacation Bible School. Um, we have a, a commitment to the little ones and we wanna make sure that we do a, a wonderful job with your guidance there. So uh, we pray for the VBS itself, but also for volunteers and the people that help with that. Um, we have a praise for uh, unanswered prayer or an answered prayer um, that took a while, but uh, we're so glad that you did. Um, we also have prayers for uh, a mom who's uh, 90 years old and, uh, uh, and needs, needs prayer. Um, we have an unspoken, uh, actually several. Um, we lift those up to you, Father. We also praise you for all miracles, whether they're little, mediocre, or big. Uh, they're all from you, Father, and we thank you for that. Um, we have praise for uh, grandson's surgery that went well. Um, we also have an unspoken prayer for family. Um, prayer and praise for uh, uh, the man we've had for some time. There is some improvement, Father. We just pray for complete healing there. Um, we have prayers for a, a daughter who uh, had COVID and now has an infection. We just pray that you will um, help her through that and with the medical team that's overseeing that. We ask for prayers for her back pain. Uh, we also have uh, pastors, wife Laura and Aaliyah, we pray for them as well. Um, again, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, at this time, um, we're, we're going to have somebody uh, come and uh, share some very important uh, information. Uh, and beyond information, uh, it's stuff that leads to life. Uh, you may have noticed uh, in the headlines, um, you've got way versus, uh, road versus way going on. You've got all kinds of stuff going on in other re arenas in our culture. Uh, there has been an all-front attack for, obviously, for years and years and years on the sacredness of human life. Uh, it continues to this day. I'm going to walk away from that microphone. One of the greatest things uh, that we see is the raising of kids, uh, the segmenting of families to come together in the name of the Lord Jesus to know their Creator. And one of those areas that we are particularly praying for in these days that we're living in is the realm of education. We've got great teachers in our public schools, some of whom come to our church, and we pray for them. We're going to keep on praying for them. They're, they're fighting a battle. We have uh, families also that do homeschooling. Uh, we have families that are in different Christian school types. And we have a Christian school not that far away uh, in Fremont that we want to uh, pray for. And in order to do that, we need to know a little bit more about what's happening. Uh, we, we put their bulletins up, we hear about them, but this morning you're going to hear from the principal of that school, uh, Cornerstone Christian Academy. So I'd like to invite uh, our brother here, Mark Eccles. He's the principal. And we also want to welcome Billy, who came with him. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you want to come on, uh, the podium is yours. Well, good morning. As Pastor said, my name is Mark Eckel. Um, however, I serve as president of Cornerstone Christian Academy over in Fremont. Um, this year I've been kind of acting as principal. However, I really don't like that job. Uh, as he mentioned, I brought with me today Billy Spencer. Billy is a member of the board. He also has a couple of students in school uh, as well. And I will tell you also, I am not a, I'm not a public speaker. So I have a lot of what I need to say written down in front of me, so bear with me as I kind of read. Uh, the Lord has a funny knack of calling people to do things that they're not good at. Um, now right off the bat, some of you are thinking, why on earth did a guy drive all the way over here uh, an hour uh, to tell us about a school that's nowhere near here? Last year, through various, I call them coincidences, however, I do not believe in coincidences. It's all uh, in the Lord's timing. 
Um, through various conversations like that, um, we were able to get in touch with and invite your pastor uh, to come and speak at one of our chapels. He came, and afterwards I was able to meet with him for the first time uh, and was able to hear or tell him about our school. Soon after that, we received a very generous financial gift from this church. Uh, for that, I would like to say thank you. That was that came uh, to us. It was a huge blessing during that time. Pastor Simon came and spoke again back in February of this year, uh, at which point he and I talked about uh, how you as a church had sent us that financial gift and really didn't know a whole lot about us. Just that your pastor goes and talks to some kids every once in a while. So that's why I'm here this morning. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about Cornerstone Christian Academy. Cornerstone has been in existence for nearly 40 years. In 1983, First Baptist Church in Fremont uh, held school classes for 14 children within their congregation, ages kindergarten through sixth grade. In fact, the one and only fifth grader that first year is now the treasurer of the school and she has two kids of her own that attend also. By the following year, the number of students had more than doubled. Uh, starting the 1984 school year off with 35 students, the decision was made uh, that we needed a building. The church owned about 10 acres where their parsonage was and so construction of the school began on the far side of that 10 acre property. The building was nothing more than a 60 by 60 square, it had a single hall right down the middle, two classrooms on either side, and then also a restroom on either side, one for the boys, one for the girls. That's the way we like it, that's the way it's gonna stay. I don't know why I feel I have to mention that anymore, but for some reason we do. Uh, by 1985, the school, Nuego County Baptist Academy, was an entity all of its own. First Baptist Church divided up its 10 acres and gifted the school with the three acres that it currently sits on. Fast forward 10 years to 1995, that was our record year for attendance. We had 52 students that year. And also to account for that, uh, or be, what caused that, I guess we had also expanded class sizes to include seventh and eighth grades. More students meant that more space would be needed, so December of that year we broke ground for an addition. A visitor's office, as well as an administrator's office, was added, along with a library, which doubles as our art room, and also the lunch room, which that doubles as our chapel area. 1999 was a year of change. Students were coming in from various churches from various counties. And so Nuego County Baptist Academy was no longer just kids from the quote Baptist Church. Uh, so in an act to be more open to like faith churches who may not be the Baptist Church, we changed our name to Cornerstone Christian Academy or CCA for short. I would also add that it was just the name that changed on the front of our building. We didn't change our doctrinal statement, our bylaws, and especially not our biblical principles. And since the early 2000s, CCA has not had any major changes, and we've been ministering to and providing students with a quality Christ-centered education. During which time, students will test one to two, sometimes even three to four grade levels higher than the national average. So what I mean by that is basically students will take standardized tests kind of towards the end of the year uh, and say third graders may test out at a fourth or fifth grade level and while our eighth graders generally test out uh, more in the 11th to 12th grade levels. Um, and we see these results within all the grades. It's not just third and eighth that take these tests, it's, it's the whole school. Um, 
Students who graduate and attend public high school will most usually test out of their freshman year and start right off at a 10th grade level, allowing them to comfortably take some college courses throughout their high school years. Now, if you fast forward to today, uh, we have 27 students currently, kindergarten through eighth grade, and along with their general everyday studies uh, throughout the week, students participate in music class, computers, art, uh, gym class, and something we call reading buddies. Now, reading buddies is where students will get paired up with one of the younger kids with one of the older kids. Uh, and they take turns reading to one another. And it's really neat to kind of watch the kindergartners uh, through this. Because they go most of the year just being able to listen because they can't read. However, right about now is the time when they're, they're honing in on those reading skills. Uh, and it's, it's a, a joy to watch them light up as they get to read finally to their older buddy. Uh, and, and they have to listen. Um, this not only helps bring our students together more as a tight-knit family, uh, but it's also kind of a great lesson in discipleship. Every Wednesday we have chapel. During this time, a local, or in this case, a not-so-local pastor comes in with a lesson for the students, uh, most generally relating to our theme. Every school year we have a different theme. Uh, if possible, we try to take a field trip or two to somewhere that correlates with the theme. For example, two years ago, our theme was, you are the vine and we are the branches. Uh, that year for the field trip and learning about grapes, we did not take the kids to a winery. <laughs> it was a vineyard. Uh, the owner of the vineyard taught the students of the importance of pruning and how through that process it produces large, plump, sweet grapes, something that the farmer can be pleased to be using. They then related that to scripture for the kids and explained the similarities that we should see in our own lives, that we may need pruning from time to time so that we, or so that the Lord can be pleased with us. Last year our theme was the voice of the shepherd and as you can imagine we took a trip out to the sheep farm and again students learned the similarities of how sheep act and why we ourselves are called sheep in scripture. This year the theme uh, is Be Salt and Light. Now a field trip correlating with this theme is proving difficult as we don't have any salt mines close by, nor are there any light bulb factories that we can visit. There was a pastor, however, that came in for chapel and fed the students salt when they thought it was going to be sugar, How, and then he gave them some salt water to wash it down with. <laughs> That is a chapel the students will remember for quite some time, I'm sure. Also to go along with the annual theme, the students will memorize a section of verses wherever we've pulled that theme from. So this year's Be Salt and Light was taken from Matthew chapter 5. So they've been working on, they've had most of the school year to memorize Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 through 16. The students then recited those seven verses from Matthew uh, at our spring banquet, which we held just a few weeks ago. Uh, our spring banquet is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Uh, this year we were, we were able to raise $3,100. And it's not a banquet unless there is food, uh, which the past few years we've served smoked brisket. Uh, after supper, each class will put together a little something that they have been learning all throughout the year, whether patriotic or biblical. Um, then that is followed by a short whole school presentation. Uh, and I would also add that we, we have three teachers. Um, we Kindergarten through eighth grade, we have, for that, we have three teachers. We have kindergarten first, and then we have second, third, and fourth, and then our last teacher does fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So she's kind of got her hands full. Um, we do have fundraisers often. We have one almost every month that school is in session. In fact, coming up next week, the town we're in will be having uh, citywide yard sales 
during which time I'll be kind of renting out spots in our parking lot for vendors or other people that would like to sell things. Um, and then I will also be manning the grill and selling dogs, brats, and pulled pork sandwiches to the community. We rely on these fundraisers as monthly support, uh, as well as monthly supporters, to keep our doors open. We currently have four churches uh, that support us every month. And I would say, too, that Cornerstone Christian Academy's mission is to train young people to build their lives on God's foundation as an extension of the Christian home and of the local church, CCA equips young people to grow academically and spiritually. So one thing that we try and do that, that often gets misunderstood, especially as we get new parents in that say, oh, I got this friend that maybe we can bring kids in. The one thing, we are not an outreach ministry. Um, I, I know that th those are important, but that is not who we are. I liken our school to that of a missionary school. We are all to be local missionaries. Um, if you were a missionary in Africa or Ecuador or wherever that may be, you're not going to send your kids to the local public school in that area. You're going to send them to the missionary school. And that's what I liken our school as, as just kind of an extension of the church as we as local missionaries have a place to send our kids. Uh, that being said, I've made it my personal goal or my mission to try and find more fundamental Bible-believing churches to get behind and support us. The most obvious way to do that is financially. However, maybe that's not possible for you right now. But perhaps you know somebody in or close to our area that is looking for education, for Christian education. You can tell them about us. Perhaps you know a Christian family in or close to our area that has their children in public school dealing with everything that goes on there and you say, hey, go check out CCA. They might be more affordable than what you think. Maybe you can only support us in prayer. That is the best kind of support there is. I send out a quarterly letter, and I believe you are receiving them here at the church. I talked with Pastor earlier once in a great while. If he's not making paper airplanes out of them, I think they're pinned on a bulletin board somewhere. They fly really well. Good. That's good paper. Um, so we do have some, oh, I'll also mention if you would like to receive that quarterly, quarterly letter personally, I do have a sign-up sheet at my display table. Would we'll Write your name and address and I'll send that to you right to your house. Um, we do have some prayer needs as we, as we finish out. Um, first and foremost uh, is our staffing. Um, our current custodian that we have uh, wrecked his shoulder this winter and he's gonna require surgery on that. Um, he's struggling to get through the end of the year. He wants to finish it out, but he will not be returning next year, so we will need a custodian coming into next year. Um, we are currently seeking an administrator slash principal. Uh, that's where I've come in this year. Uh, so being administrator-less this year uh, has been very trying, to say the least. So if, if um, keep in prayer for that. Also, we have uh, our second to fourth grade teacher. She's been with, with, with us for a number of years. She has announced that she will be retiring at the end of the year. Pray that the Lord would send a person that would be a good fit for another uh, many years. And who knows, maybe the Lord will use someone here this morning for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have 27 students currently this year. We need to see that number increase. Um, going into next year, I already know that I have five students that are leaving, moving away or otherwise. So that's going to leave me with 22 students. It's a struggle financially to keep the doors open with the 27. 22 is going to be pretty near impossible. Uh, so we need to see more students. Um, I would like to hope that not only do we get more students, but it's my desire uh, that we have to expand again in this year or in this time at a high school level of learning. Um, however, for right now, this Tuesday, 
we'll be holding an open house promoting our open enrollment for next year uh, and we're praying for a good turnout and that we will see that God isn't quite done with us yet. Well, I hope I've painted a good picture for you uh, this morning of what CCA is, where we've been, and a slight snippet of where we hope to be in the coming future, Lord willing. Uh, after, the, after the service, Billy and I will be back at our display. Uh, if you have any further questions, we'd be more than happy to chat with you. Thank you. Ask, uh, can I say first? You can, um, and then I'm going to ask, while, while Ron says something, if a couple of you want to come up, we're actually going to pray for them both and for the school. Um, Ron, go ahead. Uh, I think the way this all came about, uh, Matt and Jesse Ford are very close to us, and they attended church here with us. They uh, have two children, their oldest daughter attending your school. Um, we've been to your fundraisers, we've been to your dinners and your breakfasts and, and so on and so forth. But something that, uh, when they've attended church here with us, uh, little Ella will sit on my knee most of the time, and when it's time to do scripture, she can take the Bible and she knows exactly what it is. What, seven? And she's, well, is she seven years old, I believe? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the education that those kids are getting in your school is thumbs up. So I, I just want to, and then I think we introduced uh, Matt to Simon, and that's mm -hmm. how this ball kind of got rolling here. It was one of the great church with us here. Um, but, Keep doing the good work. Thank you. All right, we're going to pray for you guys, and we're going to pray for the school. Uh, pray as you feel led, and if any of you want to, to pray, uh, let's go to the Lord now. Gracious Father, we lift these uh, these men and this school up to you. Uh, mm -hmm. We pray for your for your hand to be upon it. We we can see how it has been on that over the years and we pray that we continue and uh, we we love children here as well and we understand the need for them to be brought up in the training and the admonition of the Lord and we just give that to you we give the school to you and their support in their student level and we, and we ask it in Jesus name father we do just lift these wonderful folks up to you and what they're trying to accomplish and father you've been 40 years supporting them, and we know they have upcoming needs, and we know you'll meet them, but we just pray maybe this morning, Lord, that those here uh, would help in that endeavor. Uh, we just lift them up to you and ask your continued love and guidance for this school, in Jesus' name. Our Father, we thank you that they have <coughs> such a wonderful ministry, of, it's so important that they, they nurture these kids, and Lord, we pray for the issues they're having with staffing. And Lord, you have just the right people to, to put into their particular slots. Lord, thank you for the fact that you uh, will glorify yourself in this school. And because your son, we can pray this. And Father in heaven, uh, thank you. Uh, Lord, uh, holy is your name. And Lord, uh, again, we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray this morning uh, that you would move in the hearts of those that you know uh, you are calling to be a part of uh, Cornerstone Christian Academy. Uh, maybe people living locally there, or it may be people even over here, but Lord, whoever they are, you know them, and we pray that you'd prepare the way, and Lord, that they would be an uh, integral part of the future of that school. Lord, that there would be many more little young lives touched for the gospel, for the sake of knowing Christ as their Savior. Lord, that they would be educated in the things of uh, science and history and all of the good stuff of education, but most importantly, uh, to know the Savior. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them with finances. You know the needs. Every year it can be a struggle. It's a, a venture of faith. 
And Lord, as uh, the world gets uh, more and more crowded in with uh, the opposite message, Lord, and seeks to remove the, uh, the ability to have freedom uh, to, to minister in this manner, Lord, we pray you'd continue to surprise uh, the community around them in Fremont. Lord, uh, keep that school alive. Keep it prosperous. And Lord, we pray that actually they would see their students increase. Lord, uh, you know the number they need. And we pray that each of these kids would become uh, ambassadors of the gospel. Lord, bless Mark and Billy. Lord, keep them safe as they go back. Bless their families. Lord, and bless each one involved in that school. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Billy. Our scripture this morning is in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 15 through 19. If you've got that with you there or want to follow along on the screen. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Simon? Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Well, I think we've um, already had a very rich morning. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, both Billy and Mark uh, for coming and for sharing. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we've been in the, uh, the gospel a long time. We are now in the book of Ephesians, and as we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians, uh, we're going to read just a couple of verses this morning in this brief time together. Um, and before we do, as always, let's talk to our Creator. Uh, we need to hear from Him. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, uh, You are the Alpha and the Omega, Lord. Uh, it is with uh, great trembling that we have the honor to come into your presence. Uh, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you're the Lion of Judah, the one who will come to make all things straight in this uh, world. Uh, and Lord, here we are, and we're able to come into your presence as ones that can call you our brother, our savior, our Lord. And Father, as we open the word, uh, just for these brief few moments, Lord, we pray that you would do some eternal things in our hearts. You know where each of us are at. You know our needs better than we do ourselves. And we need you. So we pray now that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was having a rough week. Anyone ever had a rough week here? <laughs> no. <laughs> and being the spiritual guy that I am, I was really just depressed. And I got really annoyed at God. And I had a phone call uh, that came into the office. And I'm trying to balance and juggle a lot of things. And uh, God had a lesson for me to learn. And the phone call was from somebody I'd never met, didn't know, and they wanted to meet with me for counseling. And I, in my head, I'm in my heart, and I'm going, God, no, you know what I've got this week. It's so crazy. I can't do this. I can't squeeze it in. And I found myself saying the words, OK. And so uh, I met with the individual. And as they came in, and I'm fully convinced in my head, have you ever uh, drummed something up in your head that's not real? Yeah, I do this all the time. And, the, and I was convinced it was going to be a heavy counseling session. The person comes in, they say, I only want to take 10 minutes of your time. I said, you do? Oh, okay. And I'm here to counsel you. I was shocked. <laughs> and it was exactly what I needed. They told me, please sit down, take a seat. I said, okay. I went with it, I took a seat, I sat down, and it was right here in the, in the foyer. So it was one of those fancy old chairs that we have, and I felt like a king. And they started to, to counsel me. So I just sat, and I could feel uh, a sense of the Lord admonishing me and encouraging me. That's what God does. When he convicts us of sin, he also encourages us. It's a double-edged sword. And this individual just said, look, you don't know me, I don't go to your church, uh, but I've heard about you for some time, and I just want you to know 
You have a hard role to play, as all Christians do, but I've been praying for you every single day. And I've been praying for your wife and your little girl. And we know about your love for people. And so I've been praying, and I just want you to know that. That's it. So we prayed together, and they got up and left. And afterwards, I was like, man, I just felt so encouraged, so uplifted. Now, the passage of Scripture that we are looking at this morning is exactly of this ilk. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and this group of believers is going through some hard times, very difficult times. In fact, Paul originally, before this, in the book of Acts, we're told, uh, has warned them that wolves will come in to try and destroy that church. And before his last visit with them, uh, he wept with the elders and the leaders right off the coast of Miletus. He prayed with them, uh, knowing that he would be going on his final journey to Rome, ultimately, where he would end up uh, being executed. And so he writes this letter He's chained between two Roman guards. He's in Rome, many believe. Uh, he's not with the Ephesians in the church of Ephesus. He hasn't seen them in some time at this point in his life, but he knows they're going through some difficulties, and he writes the letter. Omnisius is his friend. He's standing there right with him. He's under house arrest, but he can have visitors. He just can't leave. And Omnisius starts to write it down, and the Lord is speaking to Paul. And as Paul speaks, Omnisius writes, he then passes this letter over to Sitticus. And Sitticus is someone that is from the church in Ephesus. And he takes it back to Ephesus, gives it to the elders and the leaders there, and they read it to the whole church. And this is what they're listening to as they're going through this really heavy time. Verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Exactly the same thing. Isn't it amazing? I would love to say that I pray for you guys every single day without stopping. Unfortunately, I, I, I don't. I confess. I forget often. I do have a list and I do try to pray uh, as often as I can uh, for each one of you. But I fail miserably most of the time. And the Lord steps in and thankfully fills the gaps. But Ever since I have heard of your faith and your love for all of God's people, I give thanks remembering you and I pray for you. And, and I know that you do the same for me and I, I, I would love to hear us praying for each other that way and praying for people in our community that way, praying for the schools that are in our community and just outside our community over at Cornerstone uh, in Fremont and on and on throughout our nation and on and on throughout our world because God is doing something within his people Worldwide, There's an incredible thing that's happening. And Paul is saying to these Ephesians, you're part of something far bigger than yourselves. And I know what you're going through, and I'm praying for you. This is the encouragement he wants to give them. Now, why? He says that right at the very beginning of verse 15, for this reason. It means that whatever he has spoken before this sentence, that's the reason. We were looking for the first 14 verses in, Eph in chapter uh, 1 of Ephesians. We've seen how... The believer, these, church, these, these believers in Ephesus, but also you and me, we have an inheritance. We have an inheritance. Uh, verse 4, uh, we are chosen. Uh, verse 5, we are adopted. Verse 6, we are accepted. Uh, verse 9, we are redeemed. We are forgiven, washed in the blood of Christ. goes on to say uh, we are... Uh, sealed by the Holy Spirit and guaranteed a place in the body of Christ. This mystery that was unknown in times past but is now being revealed through the people of God, the body of Christ, the church, the bride of God. You guys, the church in Ephesus, all believers, we are a part of an eternal royal family. That is your value this morning. It's not a value you bring to yourself. It's a value he places upon you because of what he did on the cross. And that's your inheritance so that at any moment you have a time of need, you have access to the throne of grace in Hebrews 4.16. You can run right up to the creator's throne room, look right into his eyes, and not be in fear or trembling as many will be at, at some point in their lives. But instead, we can look at our father and say, Daddy, Abba, Father, I need you. And he will give you the checkbook for your bank account. You can write out a blank check covering the cost of the need for more peace, more joy, wisdom for a situation, direction. That is the inheritance. And the inheritance is not so much things, stuff. The inheritance is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
He's your inheritance. He's mine. So that's what Paul has been, talk uh, uh, been talking about here. And he says, for this very reason, because I know you have the same inheritance as me, and I know that you love people because of who lives inside of you, I cannot stop giving thanks. And I'm going to keep on praying for you. And I hope you know this. And so he goes on to say this. In terms of your inheritance, he gives four things he would like us to know. Four things. Now, we're going to get to a couple of them this morning. But he says this in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may better know him personally. Well, that's quite a statement. To know God better. That's what he's praying. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you accept him as your savior, the moment he turns you through his spirit into repentance of your sins, and you start walking with Jesus, you know him. In fact, in John 17 verse 4, Jesus says to his father as he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane, right before the crucifixion, Lord, that they might know you, and that in knowing the one who you sent, that's Jesus, in knowing me, is to have eternal life. In other words, if you want to know what it is to have eternal life, it's simply to know Jesus. The moment you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, and he allows you to know Jesus. And Paul is saying, it's not just about knowing Jesus in that manner, that first moment you received him, but it is continuously getting to know him more. And I'm praying, guys in Ephesus, guys in Sylvester, guys in Fremont, guys everywhere around the world, those of you that know me, through salvation, I want you to know me in a relationship. And so this is what he says. That you might know him better, personally. Now, back 2,000 years ago, the culture was very different than perhaps we have today. Uh, in those days, uh, the ancient Greeks uh, had an understanding of what God might be like, and it was transferred to the Romans, and so the Romans had exactly the same kind of mindset, just changed the names on a lot of the, the gods and the philosophies. The Jews, around the same time, uh, had a very similar understanding, even though they had a biblical understanding. They believed that there was a God, but they did not believe that you could know him in a personal manner. He was a distant God. You could know him to some degree, but you had to be very careful and you had to do what he said. It was a system of do's and don'ts. The Romans and the Greeks, on the other hand, they believed that God was not knowable at all. He was a distant God, if he was a God at all. And they called him this mysterious pressure that filled the universe, this understandable reason that caused everything to come together. Uh, there were laws that they were discovering in science and in philosophy that came from this understanding that there was some mysterious force in the universe. And they called him the Logos. You ever heard that word? The Logos. In our English, it is simply the word. The word. But he was unknowable. And so John comes along after the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, after his ascension, God gives him through the Spirit inspiration to write the Gospel of John. And in the very beginning verse, he says in John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. Same word. Taking what the ancient culture of his time understood to be unknowable, and he's declaring something's changed. You can know the unknowable thing that causes everything to exist. And so he goes on, he says this, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Now everyone could kind of understand this and agree with him, and then he goes on to say, and in him, suddenly now he's a personal God, in him all things were created that did not exist. All things were created. And then he jumps to verse 14, and the Logos, the Word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Jesus Christ. This unknowable distant God had suddenly made himself knowable through the person of Christ. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. Read the scriptures. As you read the scriptures and you discover what God is like, you see Jesus healing, you see Jesus loving, you see Jesus sacrificing himself on a cross. That is what God is like. Suddenly you get to know the creator of the heavens and the earth and he's personal and he's up close. John 8, 31, Jesus says, uh, if you abide in me, you will be my disciple, Mephites, one who learns. It's why we, we want our kids to become disciples, just as Mark uh, and Billy uh, have come to share with us this morning. Uh, we need our kids to understand who Jesus is, to know what God is like, to see God by seeing Jesus. And to do that, we come to the scriptures. A disciple is someone who abides, someone that actually walks alongside. It's a friendship. 
So what Paul is saying to these Ephesians is, you're going to get to know God. I want you to know your inheritance. I want you to know the person of Jesus Christ by walking with him, getting to know him, having a relationship with him. It's not a system of do's and don'ts. This is a relationship. It's way, way, way bigger than religion. Discipleship. And in verse 32, straight after he says that, I want you to be a disciple. He says, and you will know the truth. And what will happen? The truth will set you free. As we get to know the Savior more and more each day, we spend our time in the Scriptures carefully, praying with Him, talking to Him. He sets us free, gradually, over the course of our life. Now, the moment you got saved, we have a big theological word for that, it's called justification. He saved you. It was just as if you had never sinned. He placed you inside the body of Christ. From God's perspective, from the Father's perspective, you are now His child. You've been chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed, forgiven. You are sealed by the Spirit and guaranteed a place in heaven because of the cross, because of the blood that was shed. This is the reality of your inheritance. Now the beautiful thing is that as you continue to walk with Jesus, not only are you justified, but now you, have, you are sanctified. Sanctification, it just means to be set aside, to be set apart for God's purposes. God has a purpose in your life and my life. He wants people to get to know him through you and through me. We get to know the creator of the heavens and the earth. And Paul is saying, you may know you have an inheritance, but do you really know your inheritance? It's amazing. In John chapter 17, again back in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before the crucifixion, Jesus says this to his father. Sanctify them, Lord. That would be you. He's talking about his disciples, but by application, it'd be you as well and me. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Sanctification. Set them apart. Your word is truth. Set them apart by your word. It's the word of God that sanctifies us. So Peter goes on to say, a little bit later, he says this. God's divine power has been given to us and gives us everything we need for a godly life. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that we, through them, may participate in, participate in the divine nature. Do you know that you can participate in the divine nature? That doesn't mean you become God. It just means that you get to know who God is and he does something inside of you because you're a part of his family. You get to participate in the divine nature so that through them, having escaped the corruption of this world caused by his evil desires. You can escape all of this stuff you're reading in the news, all of this pollution that comes against our souls, all of the stuff that makes you feel depressed and discouraged. It drags us down by coming to the Word of God, by reading it, by talking to the Savior, asking Him to help you to understand it, because it's a spiritual thing. You cannot understand it with your natural mind. It's impossible. And as the Lord starts to reveal things, you get to know Him personally better and better. And he sets you free in areas that you could never be set free from before. And the more you walk with him, the more he does it. And if you find yourself falling flat on your face, you get back up again. First John 1 John 1.9. You'll discover he is your savior, he's your advocate, he's your friend. He's the one that places value on you because of the blood he shed. Jeremiah 9.24 says, Let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. The more you get to know him, the more he's glorified. Isn't that a mystery? The more I actually spend time with my Savior, the more he's glorified. I want him to be glorified. I need to spend time with him. It's an amazing, amazing reality. The second thing that happens that Paul wants us to know is the plan of God. Verse 18. He goes on to say, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now I'm going to kind of close at this point, and we'll go on with this uh, uh, next, next time. But he wants you to know the plan of God. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling. Do you know the hope of your calling? you know that uh, you will be going to heaven? because of faith in Christ, if you're a Christian this morning here. To know Christ is to have eternal life. Eternal life is his life, and he's sharing it with you and me. It's not, it's not something extra he has, and you go and participate and buy it. It's him. He is your inheritance. It's his life. And he says, you are now part of the royal family of God, adopted. You've been chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed, 
forgiven, sealed by the Spirit, and guaranteed a place inside of me. And this is the thing as we close. The plan of God is for you to know him. Philippians 3.10, right at the end of Paul's life, you would think he could, would, could say that, I know God really well, guys. And he would have written, I hope you guys know him like I do. That's not what Paul writes. Paul writes, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and of his sufferings. As you go through this week ahead and as you go through different things in the months and years ahead, depending on how long the Lord has us here, you will experience many sufferings. But you will also experience the resurrection life that Jesus brings. And that you might know him and the power of his resurrection in your families, in your jobs, your community, every place you go. God wants to give you something far more valuable than anything in this world. That's himself. So as we leave this place this morning, know that Jesus is forever with us. We can escape the corruption of this world through the promises of God. Did you know that there are 7,834 promises? I don't know who counted them up. I certainly couldn't count that high. 7,834 promises in the Word of God. That's more than two every single day if you were to go through one year just taking two promises and never repeating them. Just one promise alone could carry you through the rest of your lives. Hebrews 13, 8. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Isaiah 41:10. I will strengthen you with my strong right arm. You could go on and on and on, but just grab hold of one promise for this week. Meditate on it. Read it again and again and again. Take a, take a scripture verse. And let the Lord start to permeate your soul through his spirit so that you get to know him better. That is why we are here on this earth. And as we get to know him better, suddenly, mysteriously, he opens doors for us to share about Jesus and the gospel. And we may be the most shy person on the earth, and yet suddenly he becomes the boldest person speaking through us, and he's made known. Let's get to know him more this week. Let's pray. Precious Father, it is a joy to be known as the children of God, Lord, uh, to be a Christian. Lord, it says that there were first called Christians in Antioch, and in Antioch there was a lot of uh, persecution. A lot of things happening, and Lord, we don't have persecution, but we do have many, many pressures, many things that try to steer us away from you and distract us, many things that also try to just make life very, very hard. And Lord, uh, whatever it is we're facing, uh, whatever it is, Lord, help us to draw closer to you this week ahead. And Lord, if there's any here that do not know you, they don't know for sure that they're going to be in heaven because they don't know you. Lord, we pray that they would come to that realization of you as their Savior today. Lord, help them speak to their hearts, draw them through your Spirit. Lord, we pray, Father, that uh, as they come to you, Lord, help them to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, your, your word promises that they will be saved. And for the rest of us, Lord, we pray you would lead us in a very close walk this week ahead. Lord, we pray again for our friends, uh, for Mark and Billy, everyone represented at, the, at, the, ch at the, uh, the school there in Fremont. Lord, that you would continue to bless them in the same way that those kids and those that instruct them would be ones that know you better and better and better as we give thanks for them and we pray for them as often as you help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing number 206. There is a Redeemer. <laughs>
giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. I think we're done. <laughs> yeah, um, Time out. Okay, at this point, right before we skedaddle out of here, there's a couple of you here and some who are not. Uh, who are actually becoming new members of our church. I say becoming, they should have become new members about three months ago, but we kept forgetting uh, to finish all the stuff to, to announce that. So um, <clears throat> I want to thank these individuals very much for their patience. So uh, if we have Nan Riley, I don't know if you're here. Hi, Nan, I see Nan. Sarah and Jay Statfield. I just say hi, guys. Oh, man, you made it. That's awesome. We have a lot of people traveling in a way that, uh, today, so this is, is great. Uh, we also have uh, Bill and Ginger Lucas, who I don't think are here today. I know they're traveling. Are they here? Hey, hi, guys. <laughs> we want to welcome you guys um, and thank you uh, for your patience. Uh, these guys are new members of the church. Um, let's pray for them now. Precious Father, uh, we want to thank you. Uh, for uh, our dear friends, uh, and as they uh, continue forward with you here, Lord, uh, just bless them in their service, Lord. Uh, continue to protect them and lead them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we want to extend to you guys the right hand of fellowship, and usually when we do this, we sing together, uh, blessed be the ties that bind, and maybe we should, uh, we'll give it a well, okay. <laughs> blessed be the ties that bind. them too much but please go and give them a huge hug because normally we would stand around and you know and crush them and haha <laughs> but okay thanks guys thank you for watching don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the link on the upper left hand side of your screen so you can see all of our videos when they come out or you can watch last Sunday's sermon by clicking the video link on the bottom left of your screen. From all of us at Sylvester Community Church, thank you and God bless.